My name is Chris Haug, and I am the director of the Columbia Mid-Maryland chapter of Startup Grind. And uh, joining us uh, this evening also is my fellow chapter director from the Baltimore chapter in Maryland, uh, Mr. Jeff Friedman, as well as Mr. Jason uh, uh, Maserati, who is joining us as part of our managing team. Uh, Jeff and uh, Jason will be moderating the chat and the Q&A, so please feel free to put your, uh, your questions in there as we go through, and we'll do our best to address all of them. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with who Startup Grind is, we are the largest global community of startups and entrepreneurs. We have 5 million plus or minus community members in 650 chapters and 140 countries around the world. And our mission is to educate, inspire, and connect our community members with the resources, the connections, and the inspiration that they need to go as far as they can in their entrepreneurial journey. We live by three very simple core values in Startup Grind. We're here to give first, not take. We're here to help others before we help ourselves, and we're here to look for every way possible to make friendships, partnerships, and collaborate with the net positive uh, sum games and not practice zero sum games. And that is really what Startup Grind is all about. We started 10 years, uh, 12 years ago, as a matter of fact, um, this month in Silicon Valley, and we started in the Founders Garage with about six uh, fellow struggling entrepreneurs. And we are sitting here today, 12 years later, having achieved this level of growth purely by word of mouth. We don't advertise, we don't broadcast, we feel that we're doing something right. And we're here to change the world one entrepreneur at a time. And one of the things that we recognized in Startup Grind at the, end of the, at the end of the year was that we had made such a significant shift from being an all in-person events organization within our local communities to being an international virtual organization as a result of what we've all gone through the last uh, two years with COVID, that we decided that we are going to tackle the whole issue and the whole concept of Web3 and what that's going to look like in the future. And so what we've decided to do is to create a whole year long series of events that are going to be focused around all things Web3 and the, what we're calling the fourth industrial revolution. And tonight is the premier event. So we welcome everybody. We think that you are going to enjoy this evening's event and you will enjoy uh, each of the sessions that we're going to be putting on monthly throughout the course of the year. Uh, I would like to say thank you to uh, some of our sponsors and partners. I would like to thank Dell Technologies, Amazon Web Services, uh, Zentech or Zendesk, Snowflake, as well as uh, Dominant and uh, Atlantis Capital, um, as well as 360 Venture Management Group, uh, Web Access Media, and Kapausa, who is uh, uh, part of our strategic partnership. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, what I'm gonna do is turn it over to Mr. Con Connor Bundy and Luke Pillarello, and let them uh, manage the rest of the event because they are the ones who are the experts in all things fourth, uh, the fourth industrial revolution. So Connor, That's, it's all yours. Thank you, Chris. And I think experts is still a loose term. We all got a lot to learn. But everybody, my name is Connor Boundy. I'm one of the founding partners here at Atlantis Capital here with one of our other partners, Luke Pillarella. And as Chris mentioned, we're here to talk to you all about an important topic that's affecting every single one of us here as we speak. The fourth industrial revolution. There's a new wave of innovation and disruptive technology that's changing the world in ways that I don't even think we can fully comprehend yet. And that's why we're here, to bring on leaders from parts of this kind of bridge that exists today. Web two, 
and what we're calling Web3 to help share their stories and talk about the changes that they're seeing in the world. And when I say the word, I know all of us have to work together to better define it. And I guess let's start here with Luke. Luke, when you hear the words Web3, what even comes to mind? You know, when, when I first hear the words Web3, a lot of different uh, topics come to my mind. But something that I'd like to revert back to is that I believe that Web3 is this next iteration of the World Wide Web, right? But this time it's really based on blockchain technology. And really before I think that we can kind of dive into what all of that means and unpack it, right? I think that it's important for us to realize kind of how we got here in our journey and to really reflect on where we've come from. And that's being, you know, web one and web two. So let's start back in you know, the, the 1990s, right? With the, with the birth of the World Wide web. And we've got this computer scientist by the name of Tim Berners-Lee who submits a proposal for what's to eventually become you know, web one essentially. And really this first generation of the web was driven by the website, right? And this was developed and published by tech specialists. And it created this ability for users to essentially search for you know, anything really that they were looking for. But the, the barriers to entry were pretty strong, right? You had to have this significant skill level to publish and interact on the web. And us users were really kind of left there to just read what was published. And so, you know, that's really where that, where that narrative of Web 1 comes from, of read only, because as us users, right, that, that was basically all that we really had. And, you know, this kind of lasted from, you know, the, the 1990s to the mid 2000s. But like once we get to like the mid 2000s, we really see the emergence of Web 2 and, and things start to fundamentally change. See, I think it's just wild to even come up with the concept of the Internet out of thin air. I don't even know how you do that. But thanks to somebody like Tim Berners-Lee, we were able to take that concept and kind of add this layer of interconnectivity to it, which is what you're referring to as Web 2, where we can not just read website pages anymore, but now we can actually interact with them, kind of like social media. However, the internet today, as we know it, goes way past social media. I mean, I'm using it myself to binge watch Netflix series. I'm chatting with my friends. I'm playing games. I mean, now I'm even hanging out in the metaverse. <laughs> now, now, I think before we could like, you know, dive right into the metaverse, there, there's a few other things that, that we're going to have to discuss before that. But you're you're so right, you know, and like in this mid 2000s with the emergence of Web 2, we really see services like mobile access and user generated content and obviously social media start to emerge. And you know, for, from my perspective, I really think that these are the catalysts that really drove mainstream adoption of the internet, right, from, from us individual users. And as we saw, you know, mainstream adoption, we also see the rise of some, you know, key centralized tech giants, right? Like we see Amazon, Google, Microsoft, Facebook, to just name a few of them. And really, these companies have become so powerful and so influential that, Arguably, you know, aspects of our life have been changed by them and we've almost become dependent on some of their solutions. But today you're starting to have individuals ask questions like, what would life really be like with some of these entities? What would life be like without Facebook? What would life be like without Google? And really, you know, with these types of questions, the users are wondering how can they take back individual ownership of their content and their data? And really with, with this is where we're starting to see people migrate from Web 2 to this more decentralized internet, which is really being called Web 3. I love that you said that word, decentralized. I feel like that's got to be the biggest buzzword in Web 3 right now. And I know some people's eyes are probably rolling laughing listening to that. But I've got to make a point there. That's not the first time we've heard it in history. And... It's not the first time we've heard it in our recent history. We heard it pretty long ago. I mean, you could go back to something like the printing press before technology as we know it, where the printing press in its simplest form eliminated the need to hand copy books, which were only held by a few people. 50 years after the printing press was created, it sat in basically every sizable community and they were able to print more books in that 50 year span than the previous 1,000 years combined where scribes were writing them by hand. So basically what the printing press did was it decentralized the role of the gatekeeper to information. 
because information existed in those books. Data existed in those books. But like I said, they were only held by a few. When you were able to multiply that by an exponential volume, we were able to get it in the hands of the many. Yeah, absolutely. I think that the printing press is a phenomenal example, real world example of how a decentralization has been applied. But let's let's even break that down a step further, right? Like what what's decentralization in its most basic form? And kind of how I like to think about it is that what we're really doing is we're moving and shifting the control, ownership and decision making away from kind of like a single centralized entity and instead giving that to a distributed network of users, of individuals. And so how do we see this playing out in Web3? Well, really what we're seeing is that you know control, ownership, uh, decision making is being moved away from those centralized entities like a Facebook or a Google and instead it's giving back that control to the users, right? Like now you're having users own a part of what's happening here in this decentralized internet. And those users are, you know, you, me, myself, I mean, everybody on this call. And so that's, that's really where, you know, that new narrative is coming about of web three. It's the read, write, own. Us users are now starting to own this aspect of the decentralized internet. And I like that you said it's new because just think about how fast we've been moving. It's been around for what a few decades and we're already evolving to version three i mean web one was around in the 1990s and you could just read and really just kind of absorb information then about a decade later we see web two where we can actually interact with these things now we're going through another evolution where basically now people are going to own the next generation of the internet i mean that's kind of wild but one thing to note here luke We've been talking about web one, web two, web three. We haven't even mentioned the words fourth industrial revolution. And the title of this episode is the fourth industrial revolution is here. Are you ready? I'm sure we've got a couple questions as to why. Oh, absolutely. And, and you know, I think that the, the key reason there is we, we really believe that Web3 technologies are this catalyst for the new wave of innovation. And, you know, really, if if you reflect on some experts' opinions, they, they too will argue that, you know, Web3 on top of all the additional technologies, artificial intelligence, machine learning, et cetera, right, are really driving this next innovation. But what, what we've heard is that this is, you know, the fourth industrial revolution. So up until this point, we've had, you know, three others. And I think it's important for us to also understand kind of how those have evolved and have driven to, to what is, you know, today. Yeah, and I guess like we did with Web1, you got to go back to the first industrial revolution which was right around that mid 1800 period. And it was all about the use of steam power to allow us to do a lot of new possible things where we were able to create the steam engine and launch it in these giant machines and factories to create new products and services that we've never seen before. Then it powered things like the train or the boat and it allowed us to go farther and faster. Then about a hundred years later in the 1900s, we see the rise of the second industrial revolution which was really fueled by these new discoveries, electricity, new natural resources, new scientific achievements. But they all came together to help form this concept that we know today called mass production. And it was taking kind of those new technologies and doing something like Henry Ford did, for example, where Henry Ford literally used those new technologies to create the assembly line. And from there, we saw cars line the roads like we know today and basically sit in every single driveway. Yeah, and, and really, you know, those discoveries just continued to grow from there. And what, like, I'm even even a less less than 100 years later, but 1980s, you know, as we started the 1990s, we see that third industrial revolution and what people really call the start of the digital age. Right. And, you know, during this period, what we saw is those same mass production processes start to become automated and streamlined with the rise of computers and obviously the invention of the Internet. Right. And with these new discoveries, these new technologies, not only to become more efficient in our processes, but we became more connected for really like the first time ever. We're able to do business and interact with one another on a global scale that really was not possible without the, the innovations of the third industrial revolution. And I think it's key to point out there, it's all because of those innovations. It's because of that new technology that we were able to discover, create, um, produce, and what became possible because of that and how we interacted with that new technology. That's really what fueled each industrial revolution. 
I mean, you've got the steam engine, you've got things like blockchain here in web three. And so I think that made a lot of sense as to why we spent all that time defining, you know, web one, web two and web three, because it's clear web three is going to be pretty important to this industrial revolution. I think the last interesting thing to call out about the fourth industrial revolution is that really, this is like the first time we're able to discuss as a global economy, what's really happening. You know, because of those technology advancements in the third industrial revolution, we can be here on this call today, right? And have this co collaborative conversation on how this new technology is disrupting the industries that we've known for quite some time now. And, you know, this technology that's being developed today really extends far beyond borders. And, you know, we've truly believed that this is a new chapter in human development where we're really trying to merge the physical, digital, and even biological worlds, right? It's really, really fascinating. And, you know, something I'd like to just to mention is that like our goal here on, on bridging the gap to Web3 is really to kind of co collectively make others aware that we believe this is a fundamental change in the way we live, work, relate to one another, and it's happening right before our eyes. And it's happening fast. I mean, look at how fast we moved from web one to web two to web three. It's just a few decades. Who knows what's going to happen 10 years, 20 years from now. And that's why we're all here. And so I think it's time for us to bring up our two speakers today because we brought on two amazing individuals, everybody. We brought on our web two speaker, Dave G, who is a four time startup founder and a three time Amazon bestselling author. And he's going to talk to us a little bit about his experience in the traditional business world as we know it today. But he's also going to be chatting here with Tyler Dusan, who is the chief partnership officer of Safe Haven, an incredible company that's doing things that I think everybody here is going to want to listen to, especially if you're trying to make some generational wealth here within Web3. But let's start here with Dave. Let's start with our Web2 speaker. Dave G, welcome to Bridging the Gap to Web3. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. How are you doing, Connor? Doing well. It's, uh, it's it's obviously we've been planning this for some time, and you know, Dave, we've had the pleasure to connect for a little over a year now, um, and your story is just incredible. And so I'm sure the audience is dying to hear more about this four-time startup founder journey to where you were even able to find time to become an author and write three best-selling books. So tell us a little bit about you and how you got here today. Sure. So actually, I grew up in England. I moved to the States when I was about uh, seven years old. I just masochistically bought an MGB. So we'll, we'll see where that goes. <laughs> um, so um, I did my undergraduate degree in marketing. I worked actually uh, in Chicago for Motorola uh, in sales, kind of moved up through telecom, TDS, US Cellular, Humana um, in B2C, B2B marketing. Um, from there, I launched my first startup, and we provided um, ad agency services to small telecoms. And this is kind of the first time I um, dove into helping the Davids compete with the Goliaths. Obviously, I didn't know at that point. Uh, that turned into a loyalty software company. Um, did my MBA at Marquette. Started teaching at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. The digital marketing curriculum there. Um, launched two more startups and now i manage the entrepreneurship program at the university of wisconsin whitewater and yeah i've written a couple of books my latest venture is a startup called startup guides and we provide cutting edge um, business curriculum to high schools throughout well it was the us and canada now it's nigeria and vietnam uh, so we're providing digital marketing curriculum and entrepreneurship curriculum um, really across, across the globe. So cutting edge knowledge that's, that's tough for teachers to keep up to date with. Um, we provide that basically in a, in a box um, for uh, high school business teachers. I love that. And I guess, could you tell us a little bit more about some of the books you were able to write? Because sure. obviously those have some startup background as well. Sure. Yeah. So my first book was called The uh, Corporate Refugee Startup Guide. So this was, I started writing it on a whim. Um, kind of about my path through corporate and then identifying all the blinders that you don't realize you have on, whether you're in education and launching your own company or business, you know, it doesn't matter. And I interviewed a bunch of angels and intellectual property attorneys and, and professors as well. Um, and then the next book was the College Student Startup Guide. So it's literally a handbook on how college students can balance relationships 
and school and launch their startup. And then the most recent one was called Restart, The Small Business Guide to Thriving During Chaos. And with that book, I really was trying to help um, small business owners develop an entrepreneurial mindset and be willing to pivot their business models. And that kind of dovetailed with mashing up this digital marketing course I developed for the University of Wisconsin, um, which has turned into a program called Restart, where we're going to help college students um, help, uh, or excuse me, high school students help small businesses recover from COVID. Like uh, we said, it just started taking off in the U.S. and boom, we got a school in Uganda. So I have no idea where this thing's going, <laughs> but it's going to be a fun ride and we're going to help a lot of people. So I was going to say, I love to hear that. And I, I can clearly hear your passion through your voice. And so this is something that clearly you not only have a ton of experience on, but you love to talk about. And I think that's why we brought you on here because you've seen so much and you kind of have an understanding of where the world's getting ready to go. Right. And so Dave, before I toss it over to Tyler to introduce himself, I've got to ask you, when you hear the words fourth industrial revolution, what does that mean to you? Yeah. So um, if, you know, if I were to kind of define it as a little bit different as web two or excuse me, web one, web two, web three, I think, you know, I'd say internet, um, obviously beginning sharing of or creating content on web three is connecting that content. So people have visibility um, into that content and then all of the educational and business opportunities. And one of the things we're gonna talk about, um, Tyler and I talked about, is this push and pull between accessibility and security. And as uh, many of the educators that are um, on the event now, myself included, th there's some concern over there, but th there's definitely some massive opportunities as well there. So we're, we're going to really kind of dive into that and take some questions as well. I love it. I think that's perfect. Yeah, Dave, I think that that's, that's awesome. I'm really excited to kind of dive deeper into that. But before we can kind of, you know, get further into those details, Tyler, I'd love to turn it over to you real quick to, to have you introduce yourself, tell a little bit more about, about your story, what you're doing with Safe Haven. Uh, quick disclaimer out there that, that Connor and myself do hold the SHA token. So just want to just want to uh, state that out there. But Tyler, you know, feel free to introduce yourself. Tell us a little bit about your background. Hey, everybody. Thank you for having me on here today. So um, I'm 26 years old. I'm, I'm pretty young in the space, but that doesn't mean that I don't have a lot of experience. I've I've done a lot of different things with different projects and help them um, kind of bridge the gap you know, of where they need um, extra DeFi tools, tools that Safe Haven provides. So how did I get started with Safe Haven? Well, long story short, I started off as a community member and I worked my way up through the totem pole and I became head of community growth. Then I eventually became um, chief partnership officer. And what I essentially do is I embed myself in the community of other um, blockchain projects and just see where synergies lie, like where, where they where they are. And then um, we just work out collaborations, see how we can merge the communities, um, get each other to utilize the tech within our product suite, and um, just enhance the lives of others with Web3 um, protocols and technology. So that's pretty much a little brief information about me and uh, what, what I do for Safe Haven. I guess without getting too deep into it, Tyler, do you want to cover just briefly around what Safe Haven provides to to give our audience a little bit of background of kind of, you know, the services? Because I know DeFi, right, decentralized finance is so broad. Yeah. So just maybe, you know, hit on one or two products that that you think are are the flagship products of uh, of Safe Haven for us. Yeah, 100 percent. So let's go with Inherit first. This is actually like an Inherit brand. <laughs> so Inherit is a decentralized Web3 platform where users can essentially input their critical data, data that they don't want anybody to obtain access to, right? And then it'll get encrypted util utilizing military-grade encryption, AES-256, for those of you who are wondering what type of encryption. <laughs> and um, after it gets encrypted and all these different special characters and numbers that the human eye can't really read, it fragments it into multiple different shares using the um, SSDP protocol, which is the sec Secure Share Distribution Protocol. And all those shares, most of them get stored on the cold storage hardware devices, which are these little safe key devices. While there's going to be a validator share stored on the blockchain linked to a dead man switch. And that's what adds extra layers of uh, security for those utilizing our services. 
Now, what is a dead man switch and why is it so beneficial? Yeah. So let's say you pass away, right? And then all your beneficiaries, they get together, they plug these little doohickeys in, type in the pin code because these are pin code protected. It's another layer of security. And um, it'll release the plan shares that are stored on, on these safety devices. Now, when all of them are coming together, the system's going to recognize, wait, there's still a plan share missing. And that's the validator share because it's locked, right? So that's whenever the system triggers that validator share and says, okay, all the heirs are trying to um, merge the plan shares. So now the DMS triggers. And when the merge or when the um, owner of a state is setting up the plan, there's going to be a section to where they can designate the amount of time that they have to respond to that DMS, whether it's responding to an email or logging into the platform, which we will be adding on um, phone call and text messaging in the future as well. So let's say they said 30 days and they don't respond within 30 days because they passed away. Well, all the, all the beneficiaries will meet back with the merge authority, which is supposed to be the most trusted heir, could be the eldest heir, could be a lawyer, right? Mm -hmm. And when they combine the plan shares together this time, the validator share is unlocked. So now all of them can come together the critical data becomes available for the uh, beneficiaries and the merge authority to read. So now they could see all the mnemonic phrases, the, the key words that unlock and give access to the wallet in a sense. So for those of you who don't know what a decentralized wallet is, it stores all the tokens, all the cryptocurrency and non-fungible tokens, which is another form of a crypto, but it's not a supply like Bitcoin to where it has a, a certain amount of, of tokens, right? It's limited to the amount that's created by the NFT creator in a sense. And we'll get more into NFTs later. But oh, yeah. so, um, so yeah, getting back to Inherit T. Now, one thing that I want people to understand is our service, we don't distribute the assets. Like our protocol doesn't do that at all. It just allows the data to remain hidden until your beneficiaries can retrieve that data gain access to those wallets. And then the merge authority is going to be the one in charge of distributing those assets to all the heirs. And that's the paperwork that the owner of the estate is going to have to establish with them saying this heir gets X amount of Bitcoin while this one gets the other X amount. This one gets these NFTs while this one gets these NFTs. Um, and what's so beautiful about all this is it's public, like meaning not, not, not the inheritance plan, but the, uh, the wallet, like the address. So, Whenever, whenever that merge authority has the wallet address and it knows which wallet's going to be passed down to the heirs, they could go to the uh, blockchain and type in the public address, pull up all the tokens that are on there and the NFTs and update the inheritance plan quarterly with the owner of the state to where they know exactly who's getting what still, right? Mm -hmm. So Inherit T, it's, it's very, very critical for anybody who's looking to get started in a cryptocurrency, because if you lose access to these wallets and you lose access to all your funds and you can never get them again, there's actually, um, I want to say more than 5 million Bitcoin that's inaccessible to oh, the yeah. state right now. Um, yeah, no, I think, I think that that's, that's super interesting. And I know that maybe for, for our audience, it was a little technical at, at times there. So to kind of just break it down, you know, and, and, in more uh, layman terminology, it's really, from my understanding, right, it's like you've, you've got your will with a bunch of assets and essentially it's uh, a trustless, permissionless, foolproof will that then will be executed through when you have these, when you bring all the beneficiaries together, right? So I think that that's fascinating. And to your point, right, there are a number of Bitcoin that are locked up. I know that there's a number of cryptocurrency wallets that are locked. This kind of helps to allow that generational wealth to flow. But before you know, we, we get greater into that, Tyler, I've got to ask you the same question that we just prevent, presented to Dave. When you hear the word fourth industrial revolution, what does that mean to you? It's a really good question and there's multiple answers to it, but I'm gonna give the best answer in my capability. It's bridging the gap with DeFi protocols so that the user retains 100% of the access for themselves without allowing other people to have access if they don't want it to. And when I say 100% of access, that's 24 seven. So when you're talking about centralized entities, your bank, for example, you, you gotta wait until it's eight to five Monday through Friday to do any business, right? You, no, no holidays. Well, with decentralized finance, you have control of your assets 100% of the time and you can move it whenever you want. So when I think of the fourth industrial revolution, I think of applying those web three protocols to traditional entities that are still stuck in the stone age and using monetary concepts that take forever to move. I love that. 
And I think, again, it just goes back to how fast we're moving here and where we're getting ready to go. But I want to go back to a point that Dave actually made in his answer. And he talked a little bit about education. And I know we've spent some time in the background talking back and forth about where we see blockchain, NFTs, and cryptocurrency impacting education, specifically NFTs. And before we go down that rabbit hole of NFTs and education, how that might work together, Tyler, could you help us define what an NFT even is and maybe give us some examples of NFTs that you've personally interacted with today? Yeah, 100 percent. So an NFT is a non-fungible token. And what I was getting at earlier with the example between Bitcoin and NFT, Bitcoin, you know, has a finite supply. So uh, there's a certain amount of tokens. No more can be created. And when they're lost, they're lost. NFT, whenever an NFT is created nine times out of 10, it's just one NFT in a sense. Like it, it's just a token ID. It has its unique ID to where you can create smart contracts and provide permissions to those who hold those NFTs. So as far as examples go, an NFT could be um, a deed to a house, a, a, certif a, a certification on the blockchain. An yeah. NFT could be um, artwork represented, like metadata that's represented in the form of a token, and it's limited to where there's only one edition or 100 editions, etc. Now, we could, where it gets interesting is when you take NFTs that are artwork related, and you turn them into metaverse compatible items for gaming concepts. So now you have an unlimited character that has artwork that can be used in a game that no one else can use unless if they buy it from you because you own it. And it has unique skills and access points to certain levels that allows you to that allow you to get play to play to earn rewarding metrics, such as beating certain events to get a, a better reward because you have that specific NFT. So NFTs, they could be certificates, they could be characters in a game, they could even be fractionalized and put into multiple ownership. So let's take a building, for example, if somebody wants to put a building in a metaverse to where somebody can provide their services digitally, then they could fractionalize that office building into a thousand NFTs. And then Connor, you could have a piece, Dave, you have a piece. Luke has a piece, Chris has a piece, I have a piece. And then we're all getting a percentage of the residual revenue that's going through that office building in the digital realm. So it gets really, really intricate and it gets exciting when you're talking about NFTs because getting back to what I was saying with the smart contracts, all of these NFTs are token IDs, which is different than the tokens, like, uh, relate, like the SHA token. It doesn't have a token ID, it has a token contract. A token, a token contract, which is totally different. So you can't really say token contract, do this, do that. You would need an NFT in a sense to provide certain permissions or restrict certain access in certain ecosystems. Now, what you could use the utility tokens for, like the SHA token, is to pay for services within that metaverse. So getting back to the building, for example, if somebody had an office building and they wanted to use an inheritance plan service in that cubicle, well, they could use the SHA token within the metaverse to pay for the utilization of that service. And then they could get rewarded a special NFT for making a plan in that metaverse, which gives them access to another area of that metaverse where they could play with characters and earn other stuff that other people can't because yeah. they're limited in a club in a sense, right? So, yeah, yeah it's, it's really interesting with the NFTs. And I, I know I'm throwing a lot out there, but I want to mention one more type of NFT. So there's yeah. also NFTs that provide royalties in a sense. Um, and what I mean is we see it with a bunch of different NFT projects that have their collections out and in the hands of the community. So let's talk about um, Mad V Apes, for example. They're a really, really prominent project in the VeChain community. And yeah. they're getting up to around... 10,000 total now. Their first collection was 4,999 um, in, in the OGs. Then they had the fusions. And now they're coming out with the elementals to where you could do all the breeding concepts. Yep. Well, whenever you take that, the secondary aftermarket value sales, um, a lot of these projects, they're, they're doing percentages. So like, let's say an NFT sells for 100 bucks on the marketplace. And they're saying like a percentage goes towards all the holders who hold the NFTs from the first collection. That's a form of utility that's coming in through that NFT just by holding it, a form of passive income. 
So we're starting to see stuff like that pop up too. And it's, it's more than just holding something for the appreciation of value because it's a limited asset. Now it's a passive income generator in a sense, depending on which ecosystems you're in, right? Yeah. I think it's just wild to think about how many different types of NFTs there are. I mean, you mentioned one that literally it could be a deed to a house. It could be just a document that you don't want to be replicated, or it could be a video game character. I mean, think about all of the people here who have spent countless hours playing one specific game, or maybe you're playing a board game, whatever it might be. Could you imagine if all of the hours you spent into that character, you actually saw a return on that? It wasn't just, oh, well, we're done playing the game. We know people still probably play games like Call of Duty, Halo, Skyrim, to name a few. And those individuals all created characters, spent so much time creating those characters. And now people still want to play it because they actually have what you're calling utility. They can use it to earn passive income, whether it's, hey, I beat a boss, so I won a prize. Or whether it's, hey, because I hold this you know, NFT, this certificate, this character, I can earn a certain token like SHA because they've built some kind of strategic relationship with them. And the SHA token works with this NFT. I think that's really interesting to look at. And so when you hear all of that with NFTs, I mean, Dave, there's so much happening there. Why do you see NFTs impacting education? And why is this even kind of a concept that's starting? Yeah, I think, you know, I'll uh, kind of bring it back to my universe, you know, whether yeah. it's actually working day to day in higher ed or working with our client in high schools. Um, and we've got some examples that we'll share on a PDF later, but um, one of the, one of the ways that I like to look at this is, is three segments. So high schools, universities, and actually we'll say professional education. So there's really kind of four facets to consider. So first of all, you know, what is the data that's collected? So for example, at the high school level, it could be attendance, grades, and diploma. Um, at the university level, again, it could be grades, diploma, and a transcript. So obviously, you know, right now, um, for example, Connor went to IU and if he applies for a job in the future and decides to get out of startups, which I'm sure you never will, um, <laughs> someone might ask for a transcript. And at this point in time, someone's going to send an email or you might send an email and say, hey, can you send me that PDF, my transcript? And then you will forward it to Google and they will say, you know, you're hired. Can you be the next CTO or whatever? Right. Can't um, and. And that takes time. And I mean, it wastes the person's time at IU, it wastes your time. The employer might get frustrated, right? Um, and then on a, a professional level, if you're getting some sort of professional certification, so for example, we provide certification on our courses to teachers. So that's an examples of data co um, collected in today's universe. And yep. then if we go down kind of the, to the next level, where is it stored? So at the high school level, it might be stored on a student information system, right? For example, PowerSchool. Um, at the university level, same thing, student information system. Um, we could be using um, Canvas, for example. And, and actually, that's kind of more of an LMS. Um, we use something called WINS um, of Whitewater. And then the professional level, it could be, you know, our information system that we use at Startup Guides. The next element to consider is data control. So who literally controls all that data? So at the high school level, it would be the school district. At the university level, obviously, it's the university itself. And on a professional um, organization like ours, we would control it. The last point is the part that causes concern. Um, but this is where the push and pull comes between security and accessibility. So I don't want people to freak out here, but this is we're going to get into the part where, you know, people might start getting a little nervous. So from an accessibility standpoint, obviously right now, um, students and parents, I, um, I guess if they're 18 or under or under 18, have access um, to grades, attendance, um, and potentially the um, diploma. Obviously, when you get into higher ed, the students will have access, future employers, uh, definitely. Um, and so you start to ask yourself, okay, you know, we, we being the university, we being high school, um, have access to that, and we want to hold that information. 
Yet the people that would benefit from it could be the students applying in, to go into higher ed, or it could be the students, you know, graduating from a higher ed institution are like, no, 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 no. That's my information. And I want to share that with whoever I want. You're not going to control it anymore. And so when you start thinking about these four assets of the data that's collected, the storage location, data control and accessibility, you kind of you start to get this picture of all of the different elements as it relates um, to education. So there was probably too much information and we do have a PDF that kind of lays that out nicely so people can kind of look at their own universe um, and kind of start thinking about those implications. Yeah, that's kind of interesting to to hear your take on that, because it sounds like we've really got three different levels that NFTs might by, might apply to. And right. they're probably going to be three different types of NFT based on those levels and based on those you know areas of focus that you mentioned. So right. is there right. one level of education that you see adoption of Web3 and this concept of NFTs you know, happening in the fastest? between you know maybe that k through 12 that professional and that you know collegiate level yeah that's a really good question i my personal belief is professional um organizations that are certifying um uh, individuals so it could be hubspot or google or linkedin or us for example um the our customers that are paying us for that knowledge or maybe it's you know um being given out for free will demand it and if we don't provide it, they won't come back. They, they won't pay us anymore, right? So that's really <laughs> simple. They are already in control. Um, I think when, once you start getting into the university level um, and college level, they might say, look, we really kind of don't want to share all of this. Yeah. But those students are going to say, wait a second, that's mine. And employers are asking for it. And I will take it and share it with whoever I want. Um, the high school or K-12, it gets more complex. And obviously, there's privacy issues, um, you know, from a legal standpoint, in addition to, you know, air quote, an ethical standpoint. So I do see professional organizations and those providing certifications, adopting it first, then at the university, college, higher ed high school, um, when you get into middle school, elementary, I really, I don't know if that's going to happen. I guess yeah. at some point it might, um, but you're going to start getting in again to legal issues and, and making sure that we're protecting, um, obviously, you know, children and, you know, and, and young adults um, from the releasing information from, you know, simply a security standpoint. Well, and that's why you're saying it's that, you know, kind of pull push. We're right. dealing with some pretty sensitive information. Mm -hmm. Tyler, obviously, you're pretty familiar with sensitive information. I mean, that's what you guys deal with over at Safe Haven. So I'm curious to get some of your thoughts here on how you see NFTs impacting education, if you see some of the same things as Dave, or maybe something different. Yeah, so one thing that comes to my mind, being that Safe Haven has multiple different DeFi products that could help with stuff like this, is the Inherity Vault. So We've actually started working on the Negotium network for Inherity Vault, and that's going to enable storage of large data documents, photos, videos, which includes big NFTs too, which are primarily stored on, on the wallet, of course. So if you have the mnemonic phrases backed up, then you're, you're all good there. But Inherity Vault here, you could have certain documents locked in there that are inaccessible to other people unless if they have the codes, right? But okay. then when you're talking about the NFTs that are stored on your wallet that has a public address that everybody knows about because it's KYC because you're you're having it registered with the college, then in really quick side note, KYC means know your customer. There's people who, who don't know what that is. And that's just verifying your identity, like saying, hey, I'm Tyler. This is my uh, driver's license number. This is my passport number, whatever it is. Right. So, um, yeah, we we could help bridge that gap to where the student has their documents that they want private, private in the Heritage Vault, and then all the data that they want, like NFTs of attendance courses, like what you were talking about earlier, Dave, something that yeah. would be less, less uh, harmful for other people to get advantage or get a hold of, right? Um, yeah. So 
that type of data could be on your, your your regular wallet to where all they all they have to do is they go to the blockchain explorer and they enter in your wallet address and it pulls up all the tokens the nfts and then they have that easy accessible data to where they can reduce that overhead that dave was talking about all the countless emails back and forth back and forth and and like i was saying earlier with centralized inter- entities it's monday through friday so even yeah. with colleges sometimes you'll notice during the weekend they don't want to be pushing transcripts and whatnot so by bringing in the web through protocols it, it really gives the power back to the student and when you're talking about k k and um high school and middle school the lower grade levels we're totally going to see a push to DeFi there as well but what's yeah. going to happen there is it's going to be more hybrid and the parent and guardian guardian is going to be held liable to maintain access to those wallets um but i see this being a hybrid solution it's not going to be full DeFi and web three it's going to be web three and web two in a sense to where you have centralized databases that have usernames and passwords that look at certain fields on the web platform to where you could see okay this person can't let this data be released because they're not in that authority level of the platform that's where the hybrid protocols are going to come into play and you'll even see some stuff with the smart contracts so you'll see some platforms Try to stick full Web3 and, and DeFi and not even have some Web2 C5 stuff. C5 is like centralized finance, just the abbreviation. But yeah, I, I, don't, I don't mean to ramble. I want to let somebody else say some stuff on that. Well, I think it's just interesting to note your hybrid approach and how some of these documents and some of the information, hey, it's going to be locked. We're not going to have it in that public wallet. But you could have something like your attendance or your grade hey, I got an A in this class for chemistry, and I was actually ranked three out of 400 in the class. You could see all of that on an NFT and have that kind of public information available. I think the other thing that's really interesting there, and I'm curious to hear your point here, Dave, is for a college, for kind of a counselor, you're trying to help that student complete his final requirements to get that major, get that minor, figure out what classes need to be taken. I know personally, I struggled with it with my counselors, you know, trying to figure out what do I need to do to get these requirements and make sure that I'm done on time. Do I need to do some extra work? Do I need to take a summer class? Yes, I did. Uh, But having that, you know, public knowledge where you could share that information, you could have somebody that is kind of that university individual look at your public address and see, well, you're still missing these NFTs. So this is what we need to do. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, what's the thought there? Yeah, so there's there's kind of, um, you know, whether it's college, university, we'll use those interchangeably. There's two types of advising that typically goes on. So there's academic and career, right? So just to kind of obviously break those down. So the academic is we need to make sure Connor gets out in four or we might look bad, right? So, I mean, I think many people outside higher ed have say, they're trying to keep them in as long as they possible to maximize the revenue. Well, that's generally not a good thing um, because you're not showing that you're moving students into appropriate careers. So just kind of a little misconception there. So, you know, for example, universities I've worked with. So you'll start with an academic counselor. Here's your four year plan. Make sure you stick to your plan. It might be a piece of paper. <laughs> it might be a PDF or it might be on the school's um, website or intranet, right? So you can see those sort of things. And inevitably things could change when it comes to courses, but more often than not, students don't follow up and then they're rolling in their last semester and they're like, what do you mean I need that course? Um, And we're like, yeah, I kinda do, right? Um, And so I'm not saying exceptions are ever made, but sometimes they are. Um, (laughs) I'm gonna get fired for that. So. The other the other piece of this is the career advising, right? And and so when students, for example, say, hey, I want to be an entrepreneur and I don't talk them out of it, but I'll ask them why. And so one of the things, you know, we'll talk about passions they've had and all those other sort of things, but we'll dive into experiences they've had. And I think, you know, um, NFTs and Web3 provide amazing opportunities, right, to put all those passions that you have out there and skills and things like that, like Spike View, for example, right? Mm-hmm. Software that kind of brings all of those elements in. 
Um, there's all sorts of different software. It could be, you know, LinkedIn, which obviously people, you know, um, that, uh, you know, that are in school will use that. But yeah, it's bringing all of that information together and then putting kind of a lock on it to say, look, I want to keep this myself. This I'm willing to share. And this, I think once we kind of can say that, especially to educators and educational administrators is, look, we're putting the control in your hands slash the student's hands. And as they get older, we kind of talk about that professional certification, then that educational institution doesn't have much you know, control at all because there's this direct payment. They've just, <laughs> they've made a payment and it's like, I will show that and I will show that when I want to whomever I want. And if you don't, I'm not coming back. Um, so I'm not sure if that answers your question or not. No, I think that's perfect. And I love the analogy you made there with Spike View. For some individuals that are unfamiliar, it's basically a, a platform that's allowing individuals to share a 360 degree view of who they are, kind of show off their accomplishments, whether it's an athletic achievement, an academic achievement, a professional achievement. And like Dave's mentioning, they're kind of a web two entity that's embraced web three concepts where as a user, as a student, if I want to go send my profile, my spike view to a coach, I could actually turn off some of the things on my profile that I don't want that coach to see. They're more academic focused and vice versa. On the other side, if you're not trying to show off some of your athletic achievements for an academic or professional, you know, kind of opportunity. And I know you also mentioned something there about, Again, the real world, looking at some of those certificates, other things and accomplishments that people have kind of done. And I know Luke here has a pretty technical background, and he obviously has to get some of those certificates for those. I mean, Luke, I'm curious to get your perspective on all of this. And do you think NFTs are going to apply there as well? I mean, it makes sense. Yeah, I think I think that Dave brought up a lot of really interesting points. One, one other quick thing I wanted to add on is outside of just the control and ownership of this information, it's also verifiable, right? Like, I think that that is one of the really key aspects of blockchain technology and Web3 is that you can actually go to that open ledger and see that uh, Luke completed that certificate, right? I have that skill set and I'm able to put that on my resume, on my spike view, on, on my LinkedIn, right? And it's proven that I'm not just, you know, putting that out there to, to try to get the next hot job. It's actually that I have those skills and abilities. So I think that, you know, NFTs and, and blockchain technology are going to play a really big part in, in really the professional world, especially with the focus on credentialing, right? I know that I think Google spent, I don't know, hundreds of millions of dollars building out a credentialing program themselves. And really these elements are going to start getting baked in there. So I'm really excited for, you know, what's to come here in the future there. So, uh, could I, Chris, I, I see you popped on. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Can I ask a couple of questions? Um, the conversation, Dave, up until this point, how does the whole concept of the certification and the NFTs relate to uh, things like uh, the FERPA Act of 1974, regulatory control? Have we even gotten to the point where we've begun to consider the implications of that, number one. And then number two, another question I have is, okay, so now we've got this centralized, digitalized, certified tokenization. Are there implications and ramifications of fraud, of, of nefarious use, of... of you know, in the past, students um, embellishing their resumes, their certifications, etc. How does all of the, I'll say the flip side of it, play into this whole conversation of making NFTs, the DeFi, the, you know, the, the tokenization, so to speak, truly a a truth teller, so for lack of a better term, if, if that's the right word. Okay, so that's a multi-pronged question, and I'm getting yep. old. But let, let me go back, <laughs> let me go back <laughs> to the beginning. So let's talk about FERPA. People on this call probably know what it is, but if you don't, it's the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act. And basically, 
Um, it applies to schools that receive funds from the Department of Education, and it essentially takes control. It gives um, rights to parents about their children's educational records. Um, and then these rights transfer um, once a student gets to 18. So a lot of your viewers probably knew that, but if you didn't, that's you know what we're talking about. Um, yeah, and thanks, Patrick. It was 1974. I'm not sure about that. I wasn't sure what that is, but <laughs> yeah, I think you know we talked about up to 18 these keys, and you know we can talk a little bit about that. These keys to these wallets, if you think about it, at some point, right? I mean, I guess for now we're saying up to age 18, the parent has the key, and then you know after that the student young adult has the key now maybe parents have keys as well right this is where you start to get into wait a second i paid for college that's my information <laughs> you don't get that information so we're not going to get into all of those different dynamics there's there's almost this progression right of ownership from parent to you know let's say um a student you know from let's say 18 onwards whether they're going on to college or not they go on to college it's you know unless whatever you're 16 years old and you're going to college um like connor i think you started at 12 didn't you at iu i think you did yeah yeah i think I did. <laughs> so this, wouldn't, this wouldn't apply to you just just to clarify mba at 16 i believe but so this ownership right basically transfers as you move on and one of the things that the the risk of beating a dead horse is when the paranoia kicks in for educational institutions and educational administrators says, oh my gosh, someone's going to know the attendance of my seven-year-old at, you know, in elementary school. And that's not what we're talking about here. And those records aren't going to get exposed unless it's by some, you know, irresponsible party. So, um, you know, what Chris was talking about is FERPA and how that will also apply to this to any responsible party that's hosting this information right yeah. so i'm not sure chris does that hit on your questions um i think so yes yeah you said unconvincingly all right what else is <laughs> looks like tyler tyler's what got something in there, there? what did i miss yeah, I, tyler yeah, so I wanted to carry on to uh, what y'all were discussing about that. And 100%, whenever it, it, it becomes time to turn over the keys, they wouldn't they wouldn't essentially be able to give the keys. I mean, they could, but the parents would still have access because the keys can't change. So what they would have to do is they would have to create a whole new wallet altogether for the student okay, once they right. come of age and have a transference of assets from the old wallet to the new wallet. And it would just be an updating of maturation in a sense. Now, as far as preventing um, negligency and fraudulent NFTs, that is all controlled through the DAP ID. Now, when you're creating an NFT, there's different criteria that's saved on that NFT's um, details page, in a sense, within the metadata that's written on the blockchain. And all that's gonna be available when you're looking at the web page and you're looking at which NFTs are on your wallet. So a DAP ID, could be the actual sector of college that's creating the NFT. So the science department, for example, could have DAP ID number one. English department have DAP ID number two. So if a student were to try to go make a fraudulent NFT and say, I got an A plus and I'm an honor student, then they wouldn't have the capability to because they wouldn't have access to the minting machine, number one, which gives those criteria, those fields. That's what it's really called, the fields in those uh in those databases of the nft in a sense when you're creating it so uh that's how you prevent the the fraudulent nfts from coming into play it's all down to how you label the data the, the metadata of the nft while it's being created and that's why it's so important that you have knowledgeable people that, that are building this stuff for you because if you just create an nft and you neglect to make those fields in the nft to where you're not recording that data then someone can make an NFT because you don't have it set to where it's showing what DAP that NFT was created from. But those are great questions. And um, it and like I was saying earlier, it's going to be a hybrid thing to where you'll have some NFTs that are stored on the wallet that everybody's going to have the public address to. And then there'll be some NFTs that get spe specifically created 
and has passwords tied to the NFT to where you have to type in something to view it. That's what's going to be coming out next, in my opinion, because you can do stuff like that. It's just all about how you write the smart contract. Like they have some NFTs that release tokens. There'll be actual utility tokens attached to the NFT and they release from that NFT and get airdropped to that holder's wallet at a certain time rate, depending on how it was written in the contract. So it gets really, really interesting and fun. But there's it, there's a will, there's a way, right? We could go down that rabbit hole forever. And I think mm -hmm. uh, I think that's those are some great points that you made there. And I think going back, there's some regulation that's needed to come potentially. There's some big changes that are needed to happen. Mass adoption to occur. I mean, I know Luke and I talk all the time about what is the next. And Luke, what do we say? It's always through central government. And so obviously we know that, hey, there's some hesitation going on. There's some things that need to happen. And Tyler, you and Safe Haven are doing some incredible things to help make that happen. Help makes, you know, mass adoption possible. And obviously we know that the change is happening right now as we the fourth industrial revolution is happening right now. Really some milestones we've got to hit. Do you see any that we still have to kind of overcome? And if you do, what are they in your eyes? Yeah, so relating to blockchain technology and accessibility and how we're going to bridge that gap to allow entities to be interoperable, interoperable in a sense to where they can interconnect and work with each other. So number one is connectivity. So when you have different blockchains, you can't essentially go work on another blockchain if your token isn't built for that blockchain. And what I'm getting at here is let's take the SHA token, for example, it's on VeChain. So if we wanted to have it set up to where people can establish inherity contracts on the Matic blockchain, we would need the SHA token to be Matic compatible and have a token contract that runs on there. So what is the next step needed to make that happen? Well, you have to come up with a cross-chain protocol. And what we developed was atomic swaps for the um, VeChain ecosystem and whatnot. Atomic swapping, it's been around, but we're the very first ones to provide atomic swaps for the VeChain ecosystem. And um, long story short, a person connects to the platform with their wallet wallet one in a sense that has the tokens on the VIP 180, right? The VeChain blockchain. And then they'll say, we want to swap X amount of tokens to where we can pay for the service on another blockchain. So then they designate which blockchain they want to swap to. It'll lock up the VIP 180 tokens, and then it'll allow those Matic tokens to unlock and get put on the destination wallet that's receiving those tokens after the swap. Then the user just goes to that platform that they're trying to be interoperable on and access new features in a sense, right? Yeah. Then they connect to it. And now they have those tokens that can function on that blockchain. And then the smart contract can be written to that blockchain and they can have the service that they wanted there. So that's the number one thing that we um, are solving in, in the space for a lot of projects besides inherited decentralized inheritance. Uh, so cross chain capabilities and, um, and we're doing that for Matic, Binance, Smart Chain, Ethereum and VeChain currently, but we're also adding some other chains um, after we launch the platform because the platform's not live yet, but it's, it's going to be going live really soon. Really, really soon. Yeah, I think the concept of atomic swap is just super interesting. And I think you could take it at the most like layman's terms. Let's say that, you know, blockchain, let's just call it the umbrella of sports. V chain is football, you know, Binance, smart chain, baseball. Then we've got wrestling in the middle. I'm going to ask because obviously I was a wrestler. So these three all are blockchains. They're all sports, but you need and different supplies to play those sports and interact with those communities, even though they're all under this umbrella. And so what you're doing with Atomic Swap is basically if I'm a wrestler and I've got my wrestling shoes, my headgear, you know, I've got everything I need to go compete. If I wanted to switch and go over and play football, your Atomic Swap allows me to take my gear and get a football helmet, get some shoulder pads, get some cleats, 
so that I can go play football. And I don't really need to do anything besides just say, hey, I want to go play football. And these are my, you know, kind of pads that I have for wrestling. Can you help me switch? And then you help them switch. Is that kind of what Atomic Swap is looking like at the most basic level and where you're seeing kind of that milestone of adoption going where we need to have the sports playing together? We can't really have them siloed. Yeah, 100 percent. That's a great example. I've never heard anybody explain it like that. I, I usually take the concept of telling people about trains on the track to where when you come up to one tunnel, that's a different type of blockchain and, and the train might not be a certain height. You got to swap out the train. Right. But I like that analogy that you gave with the on um, sports. That's really cool. I'm well, going to I'm gonna, I'm gonna steal the train one. I haven't had that one. I mean, I, 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 I think that, Tyler, you really hit on kind of the the technical advancements that really need to happen within this web three space to see more of this global adoption. I, I would have to agree with you that I think the main driver is this interoperability between the different you know, blockchain ecosystems. But Dave, I'd, I'd really enjoy to kind of get your perspective here because you know you come from more of this traditional founder creator background. And like, are you having conversations around Web3? What, what are those topics that, that you're okay. discussing? And what are those milestones that you see that are going to drive the traditional founder into this new kind of wild west right of the Web3? Yeah. yeah so um, I'm going to I'm going to kind of take it from the educator standpoint and that tech. Of course, so we've you know, our first course was our digital marketing course. And um, one of the things we keep asking our schools is what else can we help you with? What else can we help you with? And it tends to be this dynamic knowledge, right? So traditionally, you know, in academia, you might update your curriculum every two or three years. Well, mm -hmm. when I was at the University of Wisconsin and wrote our digital marketing course, I had 21 updates in 12 months. And I quickly realized also that you can't just teach digital marketing. You can't have one person teach it. You need all these subject matter experts, right? And this doesn't just apply to digital marketing, it applies to Web3. I mean, anybody that says I'm an expert in Web3, even though it's just beginning, I'd be like, eh, are you? <laughs> or, or is this getting so granular that you need to identify sectors and all of the different elements and how it applies and things like that? So um, we've been asked for courses on blockchain and crypto as you can imagine, we're going to engage people like Tyler and yeah, yeah. people that are a tech founders. I mean, fintech, ed tech, and bringing all these people in. So you've got subject matter experts, you know, for example, within our courses, and then we certify teachers and then they deliver that content because it, mm -hmm. it's not possible to teach these sort of things easily to have one person. So teachers basically become facilitators of the learning. We credential them, which we're going to be doing with NFTs starting in the fall. Um, and then, you know, beyond that, um, we're going to actually move eventually to putting our courses online. So for example, a high school would purchase a course from us and then they would allow their students access to that course. And then they would have, there's a built-in certification program. And then that would kick out the NFT. And we're doing that on our LMS that we're using now. So, for example, Connor, if you're a teacher and then Luke, um, you're a student and Tyler's a student, what would happen is you would obviously sign a contract with us. We would uh, take the email addresses and the names, drop them in our LMS. You can see progress. We provide that to the teacher. They do things like build websites, e-com, blah, blah, blah. They go through the certification and right now it kicks out a PDF. Well, what's really exciting is that can be dumped into Web3. So that accessibility of information mm -hmm. is incredibly powerful. So yeah. maybe you're doing some sort of competition. So one of the things we're going to be doing is a demo day event at the end of our restart program and this entrepreneurship program. So these students will be able to come on online internationally and share how they've helped small businesses recover from COVID um, with digital marketing. And now imagine the power of that, right? And not just from a competitive standpoint, from a collaboration mm -hmm. standpoint. So you might get a badge, right, that shows that, you know, um, students in Barrington actually worked with children in Uganda and saved a bakery, right? So, I mean, that's a really obscure example, but, you know, 
if you're applying to Harvard, they might say, you know, what have you done that's special? And it's like, I don't know. I helped a bakery survive in Uganda, right? And and, and here's and here's the verifiable that. proof of it, right? Like verifiable, that's verifiable, right? Yeah. I mean, that's yeah. the thing. So so if I if if I could jump in and ask a couple of questions, then is there's a a universe of us who are definitely web two people. What do we as technologists, as business people, as parents, as society, what do we need to be doing and thinking about now to move ourselves in a, I don't want to call it a logical or chronological order. What do we need to be doing now to, to move us from web two to web three, going back to the whole concept of what we're do, talking about here, bridging the gap into the fourth industrial revolution to go from web two to web three without it becoming a a worst case wild west <laughs> kind of a scenario where literally the only thing the only standard we have is chaos yeah yeah i mean i'll i'll jump on that from a startup standpoint a business standpoint and then an academia or an academic standpoint it's know your customer right um, which tyler talked about that's frankly pretty easy i mean Students will ask me, how do I know if I've got a viable startup? And I'm like, are people paying you? <laughs> that's a really good sign, right? <laughs> if they're not, might not. Now, I'm not saying that's the only sign. Obviously, we know there's many startups that have millions of customers. They've never generated a dollar in revenue in California. Okay, sorry, I didn't say that, right? <laughs> but in general, right? In general, get revenue, right? That equals some sort of validation. And not just from your Aunt Mary and your Uncle Bob, right? From from your target market. So going out and talking to your customers are a logical, it's a logical place to start. So we've started talking to our clients and said, look, we're gonna offer courses in blockchain and we have this capability to show you not just the automated PDF, an NFT. Would you like that? And we got a Heck yes. So we're actually going to be starting there, right, in the fall with schools. But I think, you know, and this is one of those things I get flogged for in academia, too. I'll say, you know, students are becoming customers. There's something called the 2025 cliff, and some of you know what that is, and are freaking out right now just with me bringing it up, and others aren't. But so in 2008, we know what happened, obviously. We had the recession. Um, and then uh, par or not parents, but uh, um, adults started having fewer children. You had 17 years to 2008, that's 2025. And there's this incredible shrinking of this pipeline of kids coming out, sorry, young adults coming out of high school and going into college. And a lot of universities are terrified about this. And so it's now time to ask these parents and students, hey, what can we do for you instead of saying this is the way that you're going to get this you will get vanilla right or you might get chocolate but you're not getting strawberry and you're not getting twists on that sort of stuff instead it's like you know what what would you like from us and it's almost becoming a consumer-based education because you're not just competing with universities within an 80 or 100 mile radius you're competing with universities around the world you might can be competing with HubSpot or Google or us that's offering a professional certification. Maybe they don't want to go to higher ed or maybe they're going to get experience and then go to higher ed. Um, maybe they're going directly in, but they want to add some certification. So talking to the customers and education, talking to the students and the parents and employers to ask them what they want, I feel is the way to do it rather than, you know, take this kind of approach and say, hey, let's see if this stick, that sticks, you know, whatever. <laughs> Sorry for the short answer. <laughs> I was going to say, Tyler, do you have any other thoughts on this? I think that's uh, I agree with Dave. I agree with Dave. It, it's best just to ask the parents and the guardians, what do you expect out of this experience? Where do you start? And then we do need to push them into setting up their own wallets where they could take a deep dive and it doesn't even have to be a lot of money. It could just be like 50 bucks, spend like 50 bucks on a couple of different assets. Cause you could buy micro units of, of tokens in a sense. You don't have to buy a full, full token, 
dive into the ecosystem, see how the storage is, see how the interoperability is, how you can connect to platforms, um, see how the power of decentralized finance feels in the sense. Go get some NFTs, create an account on an NFT marketplace, go make some trades with some NFTs, see how that works. And then getting some get in some NFT ecosystems that provide different unique accessibility features. And I'm primarily talking about metaverse relations to where you have an NFT that you can enter in the game and then do certain things that allow you to get play to earn. Um, metrics like play to earn gaming experiences, because until people actually dive in and they see it for what it's worth, they're not yeah. going to be able to understand it fully. No, I love that. hundred percent there, Tyler. I, I couldn't agree more with you. And I know, I know we're coming up here on, on eight o'clock. I think that we've had a phenomenal discussion this far, covered a lot of variety of topics, dove into education disruptions with Dave, Tyler, you gave us the technical perspectives of the inner workings of the blockchain. So really, is there anything, you know, Dave, Tyler, final thoughts here that, that maybe we, we didn't cover or didn't ask that you wanted to address in, in these last few minutes. Uh, Dave, I'll turn it over to you first. And anything anything left that, that you've got to kind of provide for us here today. Go ahead, yeah, and then, and then if I could, just a sec. And then if you could, can we summarize in terms of the two or three big takeaways that you would like the audience to leave with today as things to consider what are my next steps? What should I be looking at? Because that's one of the things we like to do is make sure that people leave here with good, actionable, immediate information. Yeah. I think mine will be, you know, now we've really beaten this metaphor to death. I, I think is is know your, know your student, um, know your employer, right? Um, and know that professional that's looking for the certification. Um, I, I think that's the big thing. Let them guide you, but then find people like Tyler and Luke and Connor and Chris and, and all the people they know. And once they've told you what they want, you've got to figure out how to get it to them. And, and that's where their creativity and the magic, right, really comes in. Um, so I, I guess that's where I, I'd kind of wrap it. We do have a PDF that we'll actually share through a startup grind that educators can actually pull down, go to a website, um, startupguides.co, and you can actually have this PDF and take it to your next meeting and say, hey, guys, and, and it can be a conversation starter. Um, so I guess that's what I would, you know, kind of wrap up with. Great points, Dave. Tyler, Tyler anything to your perspective there? Um, yes, I actually did want to touch on two last things, if, if y'all don't mind, before I answer the sure, question. Do it, all right, so two other products that Safe Haven could essentially help in the um, education industry yeah. is ThorPay, which is a mass payment solution. Essentially, it allows the the college or the institution to put the wallets, like the, the public address that's going to be receiving the payments, in a ledger. So where all they have to do is create a field, input the amount of salary they're getting per month or per week or however they do it, right? And then press one button at the end of each each week or each quarter, whenever they get their payment and it's done and it, it just gets sent to their wallet. So that's a really cool product, ThorPay. Um, another product is ThorBlock, that's fundraising, charity and ICO pooling. So right off the bat, fundraising, that's college 100%. Fundraising drives, then charity drives. Now, as far as the ICO pooling, what does that mean? That means raising funds where you can essentially have enough funds to kickstart off like a, um, like an initial crypto offering, like creating your own token. So you're essentially raising funds to use that liquidity to create the token and provide the backing for that token ecosystem after you're done with the funding round. So those are the last two products I wanted to mention. Now, as far as key, key takeaways from this whole event, um, get educated. Anything that you didn't learn today, go try to find it on your own on Google. Any questions that you had that didn't get answered. Number two, go set up a wallet today. Protect those private keys. Write them down. Don't take pictures of it because all that type of stuff can get taken by hackers in a sense if you have it online. You don't ever want to have your private keys accessible online in any way. So write all that stuff down. Create your wallet. 
go get a couple different um, cryptocurrencies with a small amount of money. Don't do a huge investment. Just dive in a little bit. Get the toes wet. Then create an inheritance plan and protect that wallet to where it will never be lost. And um, thirdly, I want people to go look into some NFT ecosystems. Go look into any type of NFT sector that sparks your interest, whether it be real estate, gaming, or passive revenue vehicles because we talked about many different types today yeah. and um that's pretty much it yeah i think if you guys heard tyler and dave there the theme is education and experience do sit here and you guys have some awesome examples and you know opportunities to a different niche today and you don't have to do it tonight i know it's late this evening or if you're listening back to this recording do it when you have your free time, but take the leap to just explore. So you don't have to be the person that when you get the answer, well, what is it? You go, I don't know. I have no idea. You at least are, well, from my experience, it's this. Here's what I did. And here's what I learned from it. Because I'd say that's how Luke and I have learned so much in this space ourselves. I mean, I've been in it since and that we're up here speaking to you all today is because we were curious, because we were hungry to learn, and because we were fortunate to reach out and connect with people like Tyler and Dave. We're able to share their thoughts here. So don't think that you can't do the same. Go connect with every single one of us afterward. All of our contact information will be available. We are trying to bridge the gap to Web3 together. Our goal here at Atlantis Capital, trying at bridging the gap to Web3, is to help people understand that the future is coming. The future is for those who understand it. And we believe that together, we need to make sure everybody can understand it so we can all take part in the future. So all, I'll end on that note tonight. I want to stress, this is episode one. We have so much more coming. We already have a, another four-time startup founder and a marketing guru who helped run the billion dollar DraftKings marketing campaign in 2015. We also have the number one NFT project on a specific blockchain coming to talk to us. So guys, stay tuned, stay connected with us and get ready for more contents. Because again, we're gonna try and do this together. And in order to do this together, we need to hear from you guys on what you want to learn and what you want to see. So Chris, I'll hand it back to you. Thank you all for your time tonight. I hope you got a lot out of the first episode of Bridging the Gap to Web3. Chris, any last thoughts here as we wrap up tonight? Um, almost too many for me to be able to uh, cram, cram into, in, in, into three minutes or less. But, <coughs> excuse me, Dave, Tyler, thank you so very much for giving us your time this evening. And it was an incredibly educational and enlightening um, uh, experience. Connor and Luke, thank you for your expertise, for your being able to pull all of this together. And as you said, it's about, it's not about sitting back and waiting. It's about getting out and doing. It's about taking the action and not being afraid to make an oops because that's the only way that we learn. And as Connor said, uh, this is the first event. This is our inaugural event. We're going to be holding these monthly from here on out. And I think you can begin to see why we decided early on not to make this just a one-off high-level event about Web3. This Web3, the fourth industrial revolution, cannot be covered in two hours, as we have just seen. <laughs> 